So I talked a little bit before about UI, so let's talk about back a little bit about the UI philosophy behind Chrome and uh, how it applies to extensions. So as I said, we're aiming for a very streamlined and integrated user experience. The phrase that uh, Brian mentioned earlier is that we use a lot in, inside the team is content, not Chrome. What that means is that we want people to be able to focus on the content of the web. I mean, when people use a web browser, they're interested in getting to the web. They don't care about the web browser. Really, that's just window dressing. And so we'd like that to disappear into the background as much as possible. So this also applies, this philosophy also applies to the types of extensions that we think about that we want to enable. Uh, Chrome extensions should be more about uh, helping you discover content on the web or helping uh, integrate content in with the browser better uh, and um, uh, that, that sort of thing. So um, let's see. Let's talk about the, uh, some of the surfaces. We already talked about the browser action a little bit, but we only touched on one of the basic features, which is just having an icon that you click on and an action happens. We actually pack a bunch of other little features here. If you look at the, uh, that Gmail uh, icon he's got there, you can see it has a little counter in the corner. That's dynamic. It's overlay on top of the icons that, that we compute. So you can set the color and put some text in there and uh, rotate through. So in this case, it's really useful for showing the number of unread messages. Also, that image that, e that the icon itself is totally dynamic. So you can you know, animate through a sequence of images if you'd like. And you can even do that completely, uh, well, and uh, gratuitously in some cases. Uh, in this case, actually, th this isn't like a pre-computed set of static images. Um, these are done, uh, generated on the fly dynamically with a canvas object from the background page. So we have a single, a single bitmap, and it's rotating it through and setting it there. In addition, uh, browser actions can have uh, a pop-up. What a pop-up is is just some HTML content that is uh, sized dynamically uh, automatically in this little bubble that's attached to the button. So you can see when he clicks on one of the stories and it expands, the bubble expands with it. We dynamically size it based on the content and, uh, and uh, in, in, in real time. Now, this is useful for more than just WYSI animations. This is also really useful for things like localization. Uh, you know, in, you might have a word that in Chinese is only two characters and German is 50 characters. And trying to design a UI and a, a size and all that layout that works well in all those environments is pretty hard. So having us size it dynamically for you uh, is going to be a real time saver for developers. Another surface we have is uh, similar to a browser action. We call it a page action. Page actions appear instead in the Omnibox uh, rather than in the, in the toolbar there. Uh, they have a lot of the same features, the dynamic icon, they have pop-ups, but uh, the thing that's different about them is that they uh, come and go based on the content of the page. A browser action is meant to be a permanent part of the browser UI, something that's always valid, something that, that, that'll work all the time. Whereas a page action says, well, let me look at the content of the page and if it's appropriate, I'll show myself. In this case, this uh, NetVibes uh, extension uh, detects RSS feeds on the page. And only if there's an RSS feed does it show the icon. There's one more surface that uh, is, uh, I, I sometimes forget because it's so, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of the mi ideal minimalist surface, which is the page itself. So we have a, a functionality called content scripts, which allows you to inject JavaScript and CSS into the page itself and modify its contents, maybe doing overlays or highlighting stuff. Um, and uh, this is an incredibly powerful feature and allows you to add UI. So let's, let's take a look at a simple example of something you may have seen before. Here's Google Image Search, and this is just it with no extension hooked in. But I'd like, I've got an idea for an extension that will uh, take all these images and turn it into a nice, pretty slideshow for me. That so, is a good uh, idea. Yeah, let's, well, good thing we thought about it before and I already have it. So let's just enable that one and reload the page. Boom. OK, so uh, you see at the bottom here, a little sliding scroll view appears. And there's some nice little animations as you hover over the individual images. And now if you click on the one that you want, it, you see it has a nice fade in transition of the uh, martial arts kittens there. And uh, if, as it goes in pages between them, it shows your nice animated slideshow. And uh, <laughs> can never go wrong with kittens. <laughs> so <laughs> OK. So, um, so those are the UI surfaces that we've exposed. We, um, we did spend a, uh, a fair amount of time as well on the management uh, and, 
administrative UI of ex the extension system as well. We wanted it to be as frictionless and out of the way as it could be. So install, uninstall, auto update. We don't want to barrage you with a bunch of dialogues, a bunch of questions as you're going along. So basically, it's one, one or two clicks to install. The browser doesn't have to restart. You don't have to, uh, you know, God forbid, restart your computer. You know, it, uh, you know, it just works uh, for both uninstall and, uh, and install. And update uh, is totally silent. It uses the same technology that we use for Chrome uh, to uh, keep itself up to date and can happen live and in place while you're using the browser even. So do you want to uh, show a demo? Of yeah, the yeah. Why don't, we, why don't we install one of those and okay. check it out? So here's one of our samples that we had from way back when, a little uh, page, page action that shows the map. And it tells you in the dialog what this extension can do. And this one, it's injecting content scripts into page, so it tells you it has access to the, to the pages that you're surfing to. So you install. And as a page action, remember I said that the page actions come and go. This one is based on whether there's an address on the page or not. This page doesn't have an address on it. so. Uh, we actually, at install time, always show the icon briefly so you know where the UI is going to appear. So it's not a mystery, so you, don't, so you know what to expect. And a little explanation about which extension just got installed and how to get back and how to uninstall it if you'd like. So then it disappears, and, uh, and we're done. OK. So as I mentioned before, uh, speed is really important to the Chrome team. Uh, it's something that we think about in almost everything we do. We've got performance tests for most of the code in the project, and the idea is that every time you, that a developer checks in code, these performance tests run, and we can catch when things slow down as a result and fix them before they get released to the public. Extensions are no different. Basically, uh, we wrote some tests that installed 50 little extensions and saw how that affected startup time and page load time as we cycle through a whole bunch of different pages uh, from our sample set. And um, when, so we can catch these things when it regresses. But it, in addition to catching regressions, it also allows us to measure uh, experiments, things that we think will improve things. So for, uh, for a while, while we were developing, it, content scripts did slow down uh, page load time a little bit, especially if you had a lot of them. And uh, one of our engineers, Anthony, uh, had a great idea for how to make that faster. And Aaron uh, knocked out a quick test for it. And this is actually a real graph from our, uh, from our test when that happened. And you can see that prior to this, uh, the green line uh, was, was much slower than, uh, than the blue line, which is with, uh, with just one content script installed. And, uh, but after the fix, it went down to basically being about the same. So it's this sort of real-time, very fast turnaround performance testing is really important to us. The other reason why uh, extensions perform really well in Chrome is because of our multi-process architecture. So uh, if you look in, our, in Chrome's task manager, uh, this shows you what all the processes are that are in use by Chrome. Um, in addition to every tab being a process, every extension is also a process. So it's isolated from the browser and isolated from each other. What this means is that one uh, poorly behaving extension doesn't slow down the browser. The browser can run independently of it. It doesn't slow down other pages. It doesn't slow down other extensions. So to demo this, we're going to install a, uh, or enable a, a, a badly behaving extension. This extension is just going to spin the CPU as fast as it can. Try to suck up all the resources. This would normally you know, bring, you know, uh, bring your system to a halt. But let's, let's see what it does uh, to, uh, to, to Chrome. Now, He's enabled it. It's there. Uh, but you can see that he can drag the tabs around. Everything's still animating very smoothly. He can pull out the tab. He can scroll around and read and do what he needs to do. And it doesn't look like anything's going on. But let's take a look and see what's happening. So if he brings up the task manager again, you can see there's this one extension there that's taking up 50% of his CPU. It's only 50%, not 100, because I think his laptop is dual core. So it's eating one of his cores completely. I should have used web workers. Then I could have used both. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you should have thought of that, man. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, the, uh, so that's great. The, the browser's still interactive. But he's on a laptop, and it's probably getting warm about now. He can hear his fan turning on. So it'd be good if he could stop the offending extension. So one way you can do it is in the task manager, you can just kill it. You see something that's you know, acting badly, you can always just kill it in Chrome, and the browser will keep going. That's fine. But in this case, I think it's better for us to just uninstall it and get rid of the bad actor. So let's just get rid of it, and 
There it goes. It's all done. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about security. Um, extensions have access to what you're doing with the browser. So it was really important that we build security in from the beginning, really think this through. Uh, we work pretty closely with a security researcher from Berkeley named Adam Barth who works with us on and off in the Chrome project to help really build something robust. And um, uh, we're really proud that, uh, we, uh, that he just published a paper recently about our security model, and uh, we, uh, we think it's going to be received pretty well. Um, when we were thinking about the model, we really thought about two different, use, two different threats that we were trying to deal with. So on, there's one threat, which is that there are buggy extensions out there. They're written by well-intentioned people. They're not trying to do harm to you, but they have bugs. And because of those bugs, maybe they could be exploited by an attacker. The other case is that you have an actively hostile attacker, somebody who's really trying to do you harm and trick you into downloading bad code. Now, we spent more of our time on the first case. The reason we did this is because far and away, this is the most common problem in security on the net right now, is that you have people who write, you know, they're, they're writing code as a hobby, you know, or it's, they're not security experts to begin with, they, but they wrote something that got really popular, and some, somebody comes along and exploits the security holes that it has. Security is really hard, so you know, we all write bugs. Software is imperfect, although I should say I'm sure nobody in this room writes bugs, but, uh, you know, but uh, it, it does happen. So how do we deal with those bugs? Well, we've got a few, a few uh, strategies for, for how to prevent uh, problems from happening. First, we use the principle of least privilege. What this means is that extensions only can do the minimum that they need to do in order to do their job. They declare up front what permissions they need, what hosts they need to talk to, which browser APIs they want to use, and they have to put that in their manifest. At install time as a user, you can see what does this extension do and know that it should never be able to do more than that, that even if it has a bug, that an attacker won't be able to trick it into doing something else. We also use a concept called privilege separation. This is taking advantage of our multi-process architecture and saying that the lower privileged uh, extension processes are separate from the higher privileged browser process. And that, so that means that those higher privileges can't leak down into the extension. That even if, again, if it has a hole, it can't get access to these extra, uh, extra things. So I talked a little bit before about, about content scripts. Now, uh, content scripts are... Uh, as those of you who are familiar with GreaseMonkey and the related featured user scripts are aware, are very powerful things. And they have the potential of being kind of dangerous as well. They can uh, potentially break the page that they're injecting into, or they can actually accidentally uh, grant the page more privileges than, uh, than the page originally should have had. So we protect against this using a new technology that we call isolated worlds. What an isolated world is, is a way of separating the two things. We have a separate context that the JavaScript from the content script runs in. It keeps it separate from other content scripts and from the page itself. So the variable names and the functions, they don't, they don't interfere with each other. And the page can't even find or get access to the variables and the functions inside the content script. Finally, when those bugs do happen, um, it's important that the developer, developer be able to push out auto updates as quickly as they can. As I said before, uh, Extensions use exactly the same auto-update mechanism that Chrome uses itself. This has been hugely successful in helping us mitigate problem, you know, fix security problems very quickly for Chrome. And when, when they've come up, we push out results and get, get people updated within hours or days. And the same thing will, is available now to all extension developers, and that's built into the product. Also, the extensions are all signed with public key cryptography. So that ensures that only the author of the extension can push out updates to it. So let's talk a little bit about the hostile case again. As I said, we're more concerned about the, um, uh, about the buggy case, but uh, because in the end, extensions are going to be powerful software, and uh, you should only install th them from people you trust. Um, somebody could install something that does something. You could install something that would do something bad. But we do protect you from a certain level of these, these problems. One way is using sandboxing. So take our multi-process architecture. So each extension is its own process. And just like normal Chrome tabs, these processes are sandboxed. This means we're using the operating, underlying operating system functionality to limit its functionality. So an extension process can really only do what the browser gave it permission to do for, to, to begin with. 
And this means it can't talk to the network, it can't talk to the file, it can't talk to the registry, it can't do any of the things which would let it be, become really bad and persist on your machine after the fact. You can always uninstall an extension that's misbehaving. Finally, if a bad extension does make it out into the wild and somebody reports it to us, we have the ability to blacklist that extension and disable it after the fact. So when that happens, people who have mistakenly installed this, this, this bad extension uh, will have it disabled, and future people in the future uh, won't be able to install it. So we have a pretty small set of design principles, but we think about them in everything we do in the Chrome team. And uh, when we applied them to the extensions project, I think we were able to build a pretty robust, easy-to-use platform that uh, it's a lot of fun to use. Uh, 